Good morning and welcome. Parades, cookouts, fireworks, quiet reflection on freedom and independence. We remembered this past week that in 1776, a new democracy aspired of a new nation with freedom for all. A constitution and preamble were formed, a secular form of a covenant. Promises made to one another for how we hope to behave. Promises offered a vision of a people who believed, at least in outward writings and appearances, that we were to be a people of justice for all. We remember that our wordsmiths began with, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. This experiment in democracy continues to be complex, messy, and at all times on a spectrum of growth and decay. Here, within this faith community, we too acknowledge that we are a community trying to extend belonging and freedom to all. Through these intentions to provide radical belonging, justice, and tranquility, we acknowledge that we don't always get it right but we will relentlessly continue our, our efforts to enter into a covenant so that people on all parts of the continuum of sexual orientation and gender identity and expression, including those who are gay, bisexual, heterosexual, transgender, cisgender, queer folks, the sexually active, the celibate, and everyone for whom those labels don't apply all uh, belong. People of African descent, of Asian descent, of European descent, of First Nations descent in this land and abroad, and people of mixed and multiple descents, and of all the languages spoken here may all belong. Bodies with all abilities and challenges, those living with any chronic medical condition, visible or invisible, mental or physical, may all belong. People who identify as activists and those who don't, mystics, believers, seekers of all kinds, people of all ages, those who support you to be here, may all belong. Your emotions, joy, fear, grief, contentment, disappointment, surprise, and all else that flows through you may, may all belong. belong. Your families, genetic and otherwise, those dear to us who have died, our ancestors and the future ones, the ancestors who lived in this land, in this place where these buildings are now, we honor you through this work that we are undertaking. May all belong. People who feel broken, lost, struggling, who suffer from self-doubt and self-judgment. May all belong. All beings that inhabit this earth, the two-legged, the four-legged, winged and fin, those that walk, fly and crawl, above the ground and below, in air and water. We all belong. May it be so. Peace be with you. We attempt to be a church that seeks to be a just church. As you've seen everything that we've just said, we've been saying that for a few weeks. I've had a handful of you uh, in the last week say, are we going to say that every Sunday? <laughs> I said, we are for a while because it matters. And so it feels like a lot, doesn't it? 
And that sometimes is what it feels like when we come together in community and we seek to be a people who live into a covenant. A piece of our work to do that is to listen to you and to listen especially to those that are willing to say, you know that time when we pass the peace, like that's totally uncomfortable for me. Like if I could just come 10 minutes late and know I'm going to miss that part, I would be so much better. And so what we've attempted to do to help that is they've said, you know, there are times when I don't need people to come up and say hello to me, and I'm just fine with that. And so we have a color coding system, and it is perfectly okay for you to sit in your chair and to watch the commotion around you, and you might put your red, um, if you have these in your name tag, you might put your red so that it's visible. Maybe you're like, hmm, I need to go say hello to this person, but that's the only person I need to go say hello to. And so you might put your yellow up and you make a beeline to that person, you get in line and you wait. And then you're that gregarious soul where, praise God, I get to be with people. I've been isolated all week. Come on, bring it on. And so you have your green up. And what we realize is that we fall upon the spectrum. And you might be getting your green on and you know, like you're done and all of a sudden you don't know what's happening but you're just done and it's okay to go sit down. So peace be with you. We defer to the least amount of touch. May you offer someone a bow, a peace, a hug, a shake. Let us offer greetings one to another. Come, for we are here.
What We Need Is Here by Wendell Berry. Horseback on Sunday morning, harvest over, we taste persimmon and wild grape, sharp sweet of summer's end. In time's maze over fall fields, we name names that rest on graves. We open a persimmon seed to find the tree that stands in promise, pale in the seed's marrow. Geese appear high over us, pass and the sky closes. Abandoned as in love or sleep, holds them to their way, clear in the ancient faith. What we need is here. And we pray, not for new earth or heaven, but to be quiet in heart and in eye clear. What we need is here. Though Wendell Berry has various awards for writing and is known around the country for his literature, he identifies first when he talks uh, as himself, of himself as a farmer, digging deep into the soil, tilling and sowing. He asks a consistent question in his writing, what are the requirements of human flourishing? Berry's answer is consistently, we need connection with God. We need the earth. And we need each other. Barry's calling us back to the earth makes this feel simple, but it's not. The world around us is ruled by capitalism, by consumption and greed, asking more and more and more out of us, to burnout, to mental health crises, by hierarchies that marginalize those who do not fit into specific boxes. Caring for one another in a world where we were taught individualism and that is in, ingrained in us from birth and striving for ourselves is very challenging. We have to actively recognize the ways in which we fail to see the humanity in others and to admit when we're wrong. The Genesis scripture for today reminds us, I think, to do just that. The scripture is written after the great flood, which I don't know about you, but that's a really hard one for me to read and think about often. And I might be saying something controversial here, but I believe this is one of the times in scripture where a story shows us the humanity of the divine. It feels like anger and all of the frustration at humans and the earth leads the divine to this decision to send a flood, a disastrous decision. And in my mind, this story shows God making a mistake. But instead of moving forward and acting as though there was no harm done, nothing bad, God instead moves into making a promise to all of us, a covenant between all beings and the earth and the divine, to hold up from that point forward the sacredness of life, that, he, that God will not do that again. This story shows us the power of a covenant, that we can bring ourselves back into our connectiveness, that we can bring back all into belonging, and gives us something bigger to strive toward. So hear now these words. From Genesis. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and all the earth. May we receive blessing and call from these words.
God of the morning, of the night, of the blue sky and of the rain, of the clouds and of our hearts, we ask your presence here among us. May we understand our connection to the land and to the soil and to all things holy and sacred. May the meditations occurring in this time and space and across time and space, may they be holy and acceptable. And may we understand how we know salvation, redemption, and the rock from which we find foundation. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen and amen. So as I watched uh, that video that I put together for this amazing arrangement of For the Beauty of the Earth, I thought, huh, I love all the images of the soil and all that it gives to us and nothing about what I wrote is going to talk about the soil or the earth. <laughs> and I thought, well, why would I do that? And I thought, because that's our example, right? The soil teaches us and the land teaches us and the earth and the creation teach us how to be in relationship with all things. And so when the rains fell this morning and I didn't know what was happening and I went outside, I was like, oh, I must put my shoes on to take the dog out to do their business. Oh, I wonder if we have an umbrella. And then I began to realize sometimes I could have gotten mad at the rain, but it's just going to happen anyway. And isn't this the peace of living in covenant? The thorns are going to come, the trees are going to fall, the new life is going to spring forward, and it's all going to happen as it may. So I wonder if you remember that first friendship or setting up blankets for forts and sleepovers with those youngsters. Do you remember how those friends made you feel? Did they make you feel seen or special? Because you probably had your circle or at least that one person, maybe it with your siblings, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, I don't know. Living out on the farm myself, it was my brothers because we didn't have neighborhoods. That's just not how I grew up. And so because of that, and because of our age and our stories, we come in and out of relationships. We grow, we leave, we move, we marry. Someone dies, we get divorced, we get angry, we move, we get new jobs, and it's just what happens. Those seasons of life come and they go, we come in and out of relationships. And I wonder if you remember those relationships of connection and, and how they made you feel. Maybe it was canning together or maybe it was your job. You showed up at the coffee station at 10, 12 every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Maybe it's your walk person that you meet to go for that 45-minute walk or that hour and 27-minute hike through Moses Cone. Maybe it's that book club or that weekly phone call on your way home that your mother always made to make sure that you got home okay. We remember those. And some of those remembrances bring a smile to a face, the person in the unicorn outfit, and you're like, where did you get that unicorn outfit? And why are you putting that on right now? Do you know how it makes you look? <laughs> and others of those memories bring great sadness and regret. And this is when we wonder about these things called relationships and promises. Are we just complying with being in this relationship or do we believe in it? If you were here three weeks ago as I came back from my trip, this is what I taught for five, six weeks. And th these cultures that we create, we're creating cultures of do I comply with what's going on? And for me, it was about safety. And I began to change the word safety to love. And so do I just comply with this thing called love in this relationship? And do I just go along to do what I know I'm supposed to do? And how does that change when I actually believe in this relationship? When I actually believe in a covenant of sacredness, that this entity in which I'm in relationship with is holy, divine, 
a part of the holy creation. Because when I believe in those, it changes the scope of how I relate. And so whether we are in a relationship that is acknowledged formally like an act of marriage or maybe we've been initiated into a group like a sorority or fraternity after a season of pledging, maybe we've made some formal commitment into a group like signing this book right behind me, I don't know. Maybe it's just that informality of you see the same person on the greenway every day and you know their face and their dog and you wave and you say hello. Those connections touch places in us. Those connections are real. Belonging, right? This belonging, it incurs our connection, whether that be spoken and formal or unspoken and informal. And somewhere in there, I think there are promises. Because we are human, we see each other, somewhere in there we've made a promise to connect. And possibly even sharing time and space on a highway, right, that incurs some promise. I'm gonna stay in my lane, unless you're in Baku, Azerbaijan. And they don't understand lanes. They do not know that promise. But here in the States, we hope that when you get in your car, you're gonna assert a certain level of safety and promise that you're gonna attempt to control your vehicle. But I admit that relationships, they can be tricky, right? I did a bit of research this week and, and just the idea of marriage, I just looked at that one understanding of relationship and it seems that they can be just a bit complicated. Like when you really, 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 really wanna be angry at that person, but you know deep down that you have to acknowledge your own peace of how you showed up in the relationship. And then, and then if you really admit it, right, there are that true statement when the other person calls you crazy and wonders, what were you thinking? And then you get to remind them that they chose to marry you. And now who's crazy? Or then, possibly the relationship gets far too real, right? And this new stage of forming has really worn off, right? And so you're not dating any longer. You've settled into the reality of true bodily functions. How come these truths, right, they seem to take up so much of our time? You must know what this means if you're laughing and you can't quit laughing, right? Despite, despite the complexity, the oddity, the challenges of these relationships, the heartaches that they invoke, the gut-wrenching pain from time to time, I wonder why we continue to enter them. Because they are hard. They are complex. They are not easy and for the faint of heart, right? But when you enter these relationships, there is a heart, a hope, and there is a point that we remember why we entered into them, right? Wait, I forgot to kiss you. Don't leave yet. You must come back. We remember. Across time and space, we have symbols that remind us of why we enter into relationships. These remembrances, well, it takes on another level of commitment. Jewelry worn and bracelets, necklaces or rings. Relationships, right? Maybe it's that certificate that hangs on the wall. We framed it in such a gorgeous frame because it matters. Maybe we have that set of dishes that is in the cupboard with the glass front so that we can always see those set of dishes. Maybe there's a platter that has a special word or statement of words on it that reminds us of a time. Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry notices and remembers the gifts of creation and hearkens us back to remember to be in that type of relationship of horseback rides and geese flying information. 
And so I encourage us to ponder our signs and our symbols because if you've been here the last few weeks, I've been saying that we create the cultures in which we live by what we demonstrate, by what we tolerate, by what we reward, right? And I had this fun thing where I said, one, two, three, go, and you were supposed to clap on go. But who, who was here that day? I, we have to do it again. We have to, just so you make sure you get this, right? So on go, you're gonna clap. Everybody put your hands ready, because you gotta be ready. Because when you hear the word go, you're gonna clap. One, two, three, go. So we create by what we demonstrate. And so if we want to be in that relationship where we all clap at the same time, then you got to clap at go if we want people to clap with you. It's truly about what we demonstrate, what we reward, what we tolerate. And so for me, when I create worship, when I come and I'm with you, it matters to me what we are creating. It matters to me what we are rewarding and tolerating because we are influencers. Whether you want to agree with me or not, you have power to create a world where holy wholeness is the way, where we see divinity and sacredness in each and every living being, whether that be human or non-human, green or brown, or purple, or flowing rivers, or rocks, or the neighbor that's next to you that aggravates the dog out of you when they park their car on the street. How are we creating a world where we understand that really we are in covenant with one another? I'm gonna invite you to take your worship guide if you have one, and the good problem that we had today is we ran out, praise God. So if you need to look on with your neighbor, maybe neighbor, show them the back of your worship guide. So what we do here and what we're doing to try to create this just way in this just church is we've created a relational covenant. And this came out of a, a, a season of our time when we wanted to become wise and we still want to become wise, understanding that this is an ongoing process. It is a complex, complicated, messy, joyful, exciting, exuberant process. And so we have some statements there that in the coming weeks, we are going to begin to enflesh those. We're going to begin to wonder what those really truly look like and sound like. And specifically, right, what does it look and sound like when I think I'm right? But I'm supposed to show up with compassion, number one. Whew. One of you asked me in the last few weeks as I have returned, Tim, are you happy? And marks of growth mean that, for me, I didn't immediately say, well, of course I am. Because the truth is, how do you understand happiness in a world where there's a war still going on in Ukraine? Ukraine? How do you understand happiness in a world where our CO2 levels are exploding at the wazoo and we're living in a climate-changed world? How do you understand happiness Right? When you believe in social justice and there's so many things that aren't just. And how do you understand happiness when you're the pastor of a church and on one Sunday you have seven people and another Sunday you're like you've run out of worship gods? Like how do you make sense of that? And it's fantastic. And on those days when no one shows up, it's hard. So happiness is complex. And the joy of being in relationship is we get to do it together. And we're living in a world that is divided and isolated. And, and what the blank are you thinking, Tamara, coming up with this relational covenant? Don't you know that this is not what we're about right now in this world? And yes, it is. And that's what we aspire to here is to understand what it means to be in relationship, in a holy covenantal relationship with one another. I'm gonna invite us to hear a piece of the Genesis story this way. And I totally agree with what Sarah said in that this shows the humanity of the divine creator. This is what another commentator said. What if we understood that story, right? 
It's the bow of a warrior laid down, the act at the end of the flood account of the deity hanging the rainbow in the sky would have been understood as the act of a warrior who hangs up their war bow, symbolizing the cessation of hostilities. This rainbow then is obviously the symbol of peace. And it represents that there is so much more there than a lack of conflict. For God sees and knows and remembers all the people, all of creation. And we too are invited to remember that sign. In the coming weeks, we're going to take that relational covenant and we're going to go step by step. And we're going to try to put some flesh on those bones. Because there are hard ones in there. Try number 10 or 11 that talks about dissent. We're going to hold that dissent. And the hard part for you that are dissenting is you don't just walk away and take your toys with you. Because when you do that, we can't rub up against you and we can't learn from that. Number six that says, I'm going to ask for help. Oh, but I don't want to be a burden. Really? Whew. May we, this people gathered here, live into a covenant both old and new that says we seek to be a people called to be in relationship that forms a world that knows love and joy and forgiveness and all the complexities of living together on this planet when there's life and there's death and there's rain and there's hail and there's floods And there's brilliant new ears of corn and ripe tomatoes just waiting for us. That is the kingdom that I hope we seek. May it be so. Each week, as a part of our covenant with one another, we pray together. We offer um, prayers of thanksgiving and of hope. We offer prayers of grief and lament, maybe some joy, I hope, in our weeks. We come to this um, week also seeking um, rejuvenation and maybe forgiveness for things that we've done throughout the week that we aren't so proud of and that we need some refreshing and reminder of community and those who support and surround us and love us. So today we pray for all of those in this room who are seeking to be community and all of us who are outside of this place seeking to be community with one another. 
as you feel led, you can come up and either say a prayer and offer a candle, or you can silently offer lighting a candle without saying anything, too. child one of the uh one of my favorite books was the bible and i would just leaf through it because it was so big and you know the stories a lot of the stories i didn't understand but some of the stories i did understand and i would just like to read uh this part i understand it fully and uh it be, it, it never gets old to me <sighs> if i speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not, dis not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no wrong record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part that I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Thank you. This is a prayer for my mother who went to the hospital yesterday and we were afraid it was something with her heart. And we got good news right before I came into church that she's going to be okay. So that's a prayer of thanksgiving and continued prayers. And I would also like to pray for all who are grieving the loss of a loved one, especially when it's the loss from an overdose. What a nice segue, as she mentioned, folks grieving the loss of death by overdose, that we are coming into I'm coming into planning again for the End Overdose in Watauga event on August the 31st, which is always when International Overdose Awareness Day is. And I just had the great privilege of being at General Synod, and Curly was there when resolutions were debated, studied, and some, most passed, most of the ones that were presented on the floor passed, one of which was harm reduction as affirming to all people. And we've done some work here in this congregation. I'm so grateful to be a part of a church and a, a church here as well as the bigger church that 
can really see the divinity and humanity of people who struggle, struggle related to substance use. And um, I'm just so grateful for that. I, this, so this candle that I lit is in gratitude for that. And also just trying to hold myself together because I feel like I am constantly chasing a speeding train and trying really hard not to get pulled up under the wheels. That's been my comment for the last couple of weeks or so when people say, well, how are you? I'm okay, I'm tired, but I'm so grateful for everything that is making me tired. So thank you for being my church. Um, I'm going to ask for additional prayers for Carl Todd, which is a friend of mine. He had a heart transplant um, miraculously on February the 14th. He received a heart. But we got some news yesterday that he's, uh, he, I mean, he was doing great, and all of a sudden he's starting to reject his heart. So I just ask for extra prayers for him and his sister Carrie. just want to light a candle for a new life and my grandson and then my oldest daughter who really needs our support now. Amber, Amber Grace. These candles together remind us that we are not alone in our suffering, in our grief, in our joy, in our thanksgivings. We are all together in this. Let us say the prayer that is in your worship guide together. It's on the next page from our prayer requests. Holy mystery, whose presence can be as complex as the soil, may we lift up your presence in our hearts. May the wonder of new life come. May we hold it tenderly, caring for it responsibly. We long for the gifts of water, air, and light to be of like minds who desire a kingdom where love enriches the soil, a kingdom where hope is the connective root balls, a kingdom where composting dead organic matter is not feared, a kingdom that believes in growth and rejuvenation. Open our hearts to receive what is offered in this moment so that we might share with others out of our abundance. Move us into community and connection that we might forgive the scores we keep against those who hurt us. Save us from the temptations, the invasives, and the thorns of all that would keep us from you and deliver us from those things that seek to harm. Unfurl your perfect kinship of love, belonging, and truth forever. Amen. In sharing what we have, our gifts, our talents, our resources, our hearts, our thoughts, our beliefs, our disagreements, Right, we find solidarity and this is a piece of how we belong to one another. And so whatever gift you have to offer, whether it's using the new zero turn lawnmower and mowing for us, whether it's making the coffee or setting up this gorgeous altar or offering music or punching buttons that I don't know what they punch. <laughs> may these gifts, may they mingle and swell creating a kingdom of love. Your gifts are welcome here. <laughs>
As we receive all these gifts, I also make this time a time to receive your announcements and to highlight things so you can see those printed in the worship guide. I want to make sure July 30th is on your calendar. It's our next fifth Sunday community brunch. And in the theme of soil and celebrating all the earth has provided to us, uh, we're going to invite Holly Whitesides of Against the Grain, who when she talks about soil, oh, it is reverent, it is sacred, it is deep. And so she's going to come and offer her perspective on soil. And I'm going to invite you to think about those gifts of the harvest, whether that's tomato pie, whether that's wonderful squash, whatever that is for you, that your dishes be your celebrations of the fruit of the soil that day. And you're welcome to tell, you're going to be invited to tell your stories of why you love this okra. <laughs> or squash. And why you've tried years and years to do a tomato, but you just can't. So whatever that means. Also, if you'll notice looking down there, it says campfire cookout. So after the pride party, we ended up with several packages of amazing Nathan's hot dogs. <laughs> And I saw those this week. <laughs> they did not make it into the freezer, and they're good. And so I'm like, well, it's time for another cookout. So maybe we need to do that in a few weeks. So if one of those dates is more resonate for you and you want to help me host that, uh, let's make a cookout happen. It's time for us to regather and have fun around a fire. Yeah. Anything else that we need to highlight or to mention? I want to say, Yeah. So this is, why we use the microphone is it is another justice issue. So the people that are watching online, they can't hear you if you don't speak into the microphone. Okay. And they're just watching Tamara standing up here looking at you and nodding, and they have no <laughs> earthy idea what's Sounds going good. on. <laughs> That's okay. I just wanted to let folks know that uh, the hospitality house is struggling quite a bit right now. They need food in their pantry and they need help uh, in a lot of various ways. Thank so you. if you're friends of the hospitality house, just be aware of that. They're struggling. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks for letting us know. Anybody else? I'm gonna invite you to stand and let us offer this prayer dedication that's printed in your worship guide. It's out of thanksgiving, gratitude, and joy, we offer all these gifts of ourselves, our engagement, our faith, and our material goods. May they be blessed and found faithful, co-creating a world of holy wholeness. Wrap us on our, our eyes. Verse one only, I invite you to sing loud. I invite you to go forth like wildflowers, for you are delighted in such beauty, for you are beloved and you are inherently worthy. May you understand your own power of influence and may your own blooming invite others into flourishing in their own time and way. For God, the lover of us all, the beloved who allures us into relationship is our garden where we know wild thriving. Go with this peace. Amen and amen.